You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Welcome to the 21.5 Show, a podcast for professional pilots by professional pilots. Join Dylan and Max, both with experience in flight instruction, the airlines, and business aviation, as they talk to a variety of industry experts, share stories, and have a little fun along the way. Welcome back, pilots, to another episode of the 21.5 Show, the show for the pros. Hello, Max. Hello, Dylan. Welcome to the show, everybody. We have a great episode coming up. We're chatting with a couple of the fellas who know a lot about upset recovery training and loss of control. I think it's the number one cause of accidents in business aviation and has been for quite a while. For all aviation. Yeah, all aviation, yeah. And so we're going to chat with them about why it gets people in trouble, what can be done about it, things you can learn in the airplane, plus things you can even learn just at home to make your operation safer. So conversations with APS and Advanced Air Crew Academy are coming up in this episode. Max, one of the hardest parts about being your friend, but also being your co-host is that stuff happens to each of us, especially like flying things that we want to tell each other, but then you want to save it for the show. So it's a more organic conversation. Know, we've gotten right? better because a lot of times we'll have these conversations and we're like, God, why are we not recording this? Why would this whole show started in the first place? Exactly. But yeah, it's kind of a drag sometimes. So you started to tell me two different stories in the last couple of weeks. And they're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to save it. Oh, yeah. So one was just kind of a funny story on the overnight that I'm sure our listeners can relate to. So I fly and I get in in the evening time into St. Louis and we're in the van or the bus or whatever driving to the hotel. And it's the driver works for the hotel. And I'm like, so is uh, anything interesting going on at the hotel? Because it's one of those ones with a bunch of like conference rooms and just mm. stuff. And he goes, well, there's a furry convention in town. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I don't know, man. If people dress up like animals and there's a convention. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So, of course, I Google it and I look it up. And it's like a whole thing where people dress up as like a fox or whatever, like like full like Disney dress up with like the full head. Like you can't see who they are. It's like a whole thing. And so sure enough, I walk in the hotel to check in and there's people walking, like adults walking around dressed up like animals. And I took a sniper video. I'll send you can post this if you want. (laughs) I was walking (laughs) to my room and my head about exploded. But hey, you know, listen, people are into whatever they're into. They're not bothering anybody. They're all just getting together and partying. So who am I to judge? That's one of the interesting parts of this job is that you just never know what you might see. (laughs) <laughs> the hotel bar is always a... Uh... That's what I said. I go, well, I said, the bar's going to be interesting tonight. And sure enough, I'm sitting there and a guy walks up in a costume. The same guy that's in the video, actually, it was like a baby blue and white, some sort of cat costume. And he orders a beer. I go, hey, I got to ask you, like, how do you intend on drinking this beer with the head thing on? He didn't really get into it. He's just like, oh, you know, we have our ways. I was like, huh. So does it sound... Are they kind of muffled like this when they're yeah, talking? Yeah, just like the... that. It's awesome. Here's the best part. So the next morning or afternoon or whatever, I'm going back to the airport. And I was like, yeah, I was talking to the driver on that one. I said, I got to ask you, is that the strangest convention you guys ever have at this hotel? And he goes, no, man. Before COVID, we used to have the bronies come in. I'm like, the what? <laughs> he says the bronies. And this is adult males that are huge fans of My Little Ponies. Oh, it was in like, bro, okay. <laughs> yeah, and they they like have like figurines and they like, I Googled it, of course, too. And there's like pictures yeah. of dudes and their hair is kind of like different colors like the My Little Ponies. And again, whatever you're into, they're not bothering anybody. So wow. I've had it. Shout out to the bronies <laughs> here. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> APS and uh, the Sir Crew Academy are going, I thought we were talking about upset recovery on the show. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> all aspects of aviation, which is inclusive here? of <laughs> stories from the road. So, and then the other thing I was going to tell you about that I stopped is flying the XLS. We had a technically a high speed abort because it was like right at between 80 and 90 knots, I'd say. Okay. So we're at thrust and I was in the right seat out and I was not flying pilot and my other pilot was flying. And I literally say 80 knots and we get bing and we get a cast message and it comes up and it says uh, nose door open. And I don't know if you've seen on XLs, I think a lot of systems too, but they have the doors that are on the nose that open laterally to the sides. Yeah. 
and there's avionics bait and oxygen bottles and stuff in there. So normally for any other door on the airplane, I, I probably wouldn't abort a takeoff because most of them open into the slipstream, you know, and it would just trail and you go back, come yeah. back around and land or whatever. Right. This one though, if it actually opened, it would rip off and pretty sure have a good chance of going into the motor. So it's interesting though, in that, that whatever it is, a couple of seconds, I guess. Yeah. Christian, he's like, I see it. And I had time to actually go through that thought process, like in a matter of whatever, a second or two. And Christian goes, abort? Like a question. And right as I like finished that thought and I was like, yeah, abort. Cause you think you're like, okay, how fast are we going? We had the tons of runway, fortunately. And then I thought about the ramifications of that door opening in flight. And as the airspeed builds, especially, you know? Right. And so of course, so we abort. We didn't even use a lot of brake because so we didn't have turnaround problems and stuff because we had tons of yeah. rolling. We exit, get off, taxi back, shut down. And of course, it was like one latch was barely not done. So it, mm. more than likely, it would not have opened in flight anyway. It just as we got enough airspeed, it sucked the door open enough to come off the micro switch and give us the warning. So it was just interesting because I don't think I've ever aborted a takeoff going that fast before. And it was surprising to me how quickly you can like, think process and make a decision and then stop like it's not like in the sim when you're already pulling the thrust to idle as soon as you hear the warning because you right. know it's coming but that reaction time they build in into the performance and stuff i have to say it's probably pretty accurate i'm really impressed that you were able to kind of mentally get through all of that and then say hey you know this is why this is a good idea honestly so was i i, I was surprised that you can think about all of that quick and make a decision so this leads me to, like you said in the sim, unfortunately, we've talked about this many times, you often know that there's an abort coming or the abort is so obvious that you just do it. But I remember one time in the sim, we had a great, they put us on a shorter runway and it was part of a longer scenario. So it didn't make you think that the abort was coming up, but then they popped a tire on us maybe at like 90 knots. And you could feel this like boom. And then the airplane kind of started to feel weird. And that was a really good scenario because most airplanes aren't going to give you a cast message saying tire pop or anything like that. So what actually happened and what should you do? And is it actually better to stop or is it better to keep going? I don't know. I love those scenarios where it makes you think a little bit and just like what you're saying. So I know definitely when I go to training next time, I'm going to ask them to see if they have any good gray area aborts just to start a conversation and just kind of open your eyes to different possibilities. Yeah, that's a great one. And we always brief, especially at the 121 level about we're only going to abort for engine fire, failure, yeah. something that your plane's not going to fly or, or a predictive wind shear warning because yeah. we have that system. And other than that, you're going. And I think that that in that world, in the 737 and, and a lot of the takeoff performance we're dealing with and reduced yeah. thrust and all this other dynamics, but I think it's a little bit different. And shout out to Christian too. He actually pulled the thrust to idle. You have to manually extend the speed brake in an airplane. He grabbed the speed brake, put the TRs up. Like he executed a textbook abort. We were mm -hmm. right on center line and he did a great job. It was quick. So it was just a good learning experience. I felt like we did a good job. I felt like it was the right decision given all of the factors that played into that. And then even if you carry that scenario down and you say, well, what happened if that happened five knots from rotation? Like, would that have changed something? Yeah, I think at that point you're you're going. You're going, yeah. You're going to anticipate a potential door flying off and hitting the motor and, and whatever ramifications come from that. Because at that point, I think the risk of the abort is higher than the risk of continuing. Yeah. Even if we were at 100, it was just literally, it was like right after, it was like 80 knots, bing, and then, to yeah. Abort, two things. So it was kind of a unique situation, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great conversation. And like I said, if you could challenge yourself in the sim with some of those maybe not so black and white type of abort decisions. To go back to what you're saying about the tire blowing. So if the tire blows and you're above 80 knots, you know, blows in the sim and, you know, we've done the abort higher speed abort with a tire, the sim starts to like skid and you know, yeah. You're like all over the place to hold it on the runway and with the tiller. If you're in an airplane with a tiller, and usually the problem is that people grab the tiller too high speed to try and steer it. And then they get overcorrect. And if you have an airplane, especially if it has a little bit of nose wheel steering with the rudder, it seems to get very squirrely. I mean, it obviously depends on a two wheel versus single wheel truck for the main gear. But 
the point is, especially he did it on a shorter runway so that all your stopping numbers are predicated on all your tires. So that was the other thing was like, you hear this noise, you can feel something weird, but do you have the discipline to keep going? Well, that's the thing. And then also remember, as you slow at that point, more weight's going to come onto the landing gear, right? And so certainly in a shorter runway too, I think in that case that you go. Well, exactly. And I think they set it up. This instructor did such a good job because the point was almost, I want you to abort so that you can see that it's probably not a good idea. And then that's what most people would do. They would lose control either while they're stopping or they'd overrun because they don't have the braking power they thought they did. So it was a good lesson. That's the difference between a very valuable training session and a check in the box session. And I've had a couple of those too, of both, where you go and you bang out the stuff, check the box and go home. And then I've had ones where I've really taken a lot away that really changed the way I operate, which to this day, like remember I told you the one with where we did a bunch of flaps 10 and flaps 20 takeoffs in the Gulfstream 3 and how much the of what the difference is in second segment versus takeoff distance is marginally different. But the second segment is drastic in certain situations when you're heavy and hot, hot, you know, all that stuff. Everyone always took off flaps 20. Everyone probably still does, but I always defaulted to 10 when it was prudent. And most of the time, even now in the XLS, it's like two flap settings. And I always take off the lesser one because the second segment is so much hairier. Right. We got a lot to get to, Max. So let's jump right in. Shout out to all of our listeners who keep buying these hats. We've only got five left. Peter, Marcus, and Gregory. God, what a success. Unbelievable. I think I'm going to reorder because I love those hats. Maybe get some more. Let's do like another little. Oh, it'll be a different. Yeah, but. Yeah, these are going to be limited production runs to really drive up the value. That's right. (laughs) That's right. Very rare. On to the reviews for us on Apple Podcasts. And I'll be sending them some stickers, some swag for doing that. All they got to do is shoot me an email at info at 2115podcast.com with your mailing address. And I'll shoot it over to you. And I'd love to send you some stickers as well if you write a review for us. This one says, meow. It's the only thing I haven't heard on your 215. I was drawn to your podcast because I have the pleasure of being acquainted with two of your guests, Jim Dunn and Eric Sabaston. Besides their great episodes, I was excited to see the breadth of topics you cover in the industry. I'm lucky enough to have been a part of a lot of the topic areas because of a very circuitous path in my career. However, for those who follow a more traditional path, it's great to be able to hear what's happening in other sectors of our industry or potentially even learn about sectors they didn't know existed. Kudos, and that's T. Shuby. Thanks, T. Shuby. Over to the mailbag, brought to you by our friends at Advanced Air Crew Academy, who you're going to hear from later in this episode, aircrewacademy.com, to check out all of their offerings. We're going to get in depth with one of their offerings so you can learn a little bit more about all of the expertise that they can provide your flight department for all their educational needs. Go ahead, Max. Good morning, Max and Dylan. Love the show. Been listening since the beginning. I just listened to episode 74 and the topic of the corporate to airline job switch came up. It was mentioned if there was anyone out there that went to the airlines and hated it and went back. While I did not hate the airlines, in fact, I did enjoy it and learned a ton. But I did go back to corporate and love it. I started my career in corporate, switched to airline flying, and went back to corporate eight years ago and haven't looked back. I get far more job satisfaction out of my corporate job than I ever did at the airlines. Is my job perfect? Of course not. But for me and my family, my corporate job has given us a life that would be tough to beat anywhere else. My flight department is very close-knit. Our passengers are wonderful, and we are given all the tools to do our job successfully. There are drawbacks, but there are perks to compensate for those that help balance out the job. I could go on and on, but most people have already heard all the pros and cons of airline and corporate life. Keep up the good work. I always look forward to the next episode, Ethan. Yeah, I don't think it's common, but there's certainly people out there. I flew with a captain at my airline job last week, and he was telling me about a buddy of his that was working at United and was on a triple seven or seven, eight, seven or something, you know, had been there for like a while and was a FO flying long haul or international. And he quit and it's flying at 550 now. And knowing that we're trying to find some of these people and hear their story, I, of course, informed him of our podcast and said, we would love to talk to that gentleman if he would be willing to talk. So it's the best job in aviation is a part 91 job. And the worst job in aviation is part 91 job. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, people that leave to go to the airlines probably don't come back. And I tell you what, if I went to the airlines, and I know I beat this horse all the time, but if I was like 
lived where I really wanted to live and there was no hopes of being based in the city I lived, I would seriously consider or probably would have never gone to the airlines or yeah. would come back to corporate for sure. Well, keep those stories coming. I'd like to hear more. I was flying with somebody the other day and they mentioned that uh, fractional stuff because of the living situation that was still number one on their list. And I was looking at our downloads the other day, that episode we did on the fractionals, Max, uh-huh. it wasn't that long ago. That is by far and away our number one downloaded episode. You're kidding me. Yeah. The aviation alerts email from yesterday is the first articles responding to demand FlexJet adding pilots and aircraft and talks about their whole deal expansion, the starting total compensation of $128,000 for first year pilots. And the quote at the end is, we want FlexJet to be a career destination for pilots, not only for the long-term earning potential, but schedule, quality of life, and modern equipment, said FlexJet CEO, o, Megan Wolf. And I go. think all the other fractionals probably mirror right that sentiment. Lots of different options the, out, out there. The gigs are getting good. Yeah, that's good. And I'm happy that we can bring some of that to light. There's more than one path. Next email says, hey, Dylan and Max, big fan of the show. It always seems to make the drive to the airport during Atlanta rush hour less painful. I have a question as well as a suggestion for a segment. I really enjoy the content you featured with Tim Pope. On a previous episode, Tim unpacked potential future tax implications that might hurt disciplined and savers such as myself. When looking for a financial advisor, what are some of the red flags or criteria that needs to be met? My airline first officers have the ability to avoid being scheduled with captains. They designate a no-fly list of sorts. Fortunately, my experience have been mostly positive thus far, but I've heard some war stories. I think it would be humorous to hear some tales of the worst co-workers to fly with, like the impatient captain who makes a snarky remark to ATC when it's your leg on the radios. A settle down, Captain Happy 7700. I'm Derek. Good questions on the red flags. We'll have Tim address that next time we talk to him. I would say the number one red flag is that the person managing your money is a professional pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and not a CFP, but we'll let Tim break exactly. that one down. Google the term fiduciary if you don't know what that means. What and about Tim's LinkedIn video? Unbelievable. We Some should... of the hottest content on the internet. We'll post a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Tim is a master. It's a true tribute to uh, the art of film. Good work, Tim. We'll get some more red flags from Tim next time we talk to him. The no fly list. Do you guys have a no fly list? Yeah, it's called avoidance bid. Same thing. Yeah, you know? There was only one person I put on mine. I don't have anybody. I've, I haven't flown with anybody that's got under my skin yet. I mean, it's inevitable. They're all out there. But I guess it depends. T- Maybe I'm just get along with people so well that it's not an issue. Well, <laughs> the, the nice thing is, too, when you live in a big base, especially for you, when you guys have only one fleet type. So what are their are there thousands of pilots in your domicile? Not in our domicile, but I've flown you, with the same person yeah. twice, maybe. You know, yeah. Versus like if you're a commuter in a small base with like 30 captains or something like yeah. I was, right. then it's like, oh, this is... Actually, well, it's usually pretty evident because you always see their trips on the open, open trips, the same <laughs> captains. You're like, huh, people are either calling in sick, dropping, you know, trading out, whatever yep. of the same. And it becomes pretty evident, I think. It's pretty clear. The thing I hated more with the radio thing he mentioned is actually not when it's your leg and then the captain's talking on the radio. It's when it's you're the one on the radio, but then the captain is making you say dumb things. I get I that too. I just had that. that where it's like, oh, see if we can get direct here. It's literally like a three degree heading change. It's yeah. going to make zero difference except for just hassle everybody. But again, it's one of those things just like you can get upset about it or you just be like, who cares? I had one of the opposite, like going into Burbank. You know how you can't just go directly to Burbank from the east? You have to come from the north or the south. So we're coming from the east on the north side. Was, See if we can get direct to the airport. I'm like, dude, this just doesn't work. And I'm like, I really don't want to make this transmission. <laughs> I should have done it in an accent. Yeah, you, know, you know, it's always a good one to say, though, when that happens. Yeah. Captain is requesting. I'm happy to ask, but I'll bet you a beer they say no. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to ask. It's no, like, what's the harm? <laughs> <laughs> Senator, the uh, captain is requesting direct to Burbank. <laughs> we could just going to throw him under the bus on the radio next time. <laughs> <laughs> captain uh, Smith, employee number uh, 625423 is requesting that we uh, see if we can get direct. See, phone number 602. <laughs> all right. Uh, you want to read the last email from our boy, Charlie? Hi, Max and Dylan. I was all about packing food back in the day as a glorious RJ commander. I made curries, salads, chicken and rice, you name it. It was delicious. 
I saved a ton of money until one night in Saskatoon on the first layer of a four-day trip when the refrigerator froze all of my salads and greens completely solid. I was so incensed that I threw all of my destroyed food across the hotel room in the general direction of the garbage and ventured out in the below zero weather to Tim Hortons. I've never packed perishable food on a trip ever again. Better luck to the rest of you intrepid road warriors. P.S. RJ sweaters are ter- still terrible. Best. Charlie and SFO. That's all it took. Some frozen greens and it was over. Well, Tim Hortons too. That helps. Saskatoon. I mean, why even use a fridge? Wouldn't you just kind of put your stuff outside? You should be and then fine. It's sure to freeze. <laughs> put it on the patio. I had another good story about that. I had food in my bag and I fly to Cancun and I'm deadheading home or deadheading back out. So I get there and they make me go through customs, all the passengers, and then I have to come back in through security back to the terminal to deadhead back. It it was madness. But I go through customs and then you go through like their agriculture and the dogs start sniffing my food bag. And so they're like, oh, you got to come over here. And the Mexicans took all of my food and threw it all away. So... Boom. I can sympathize. Then did you go right to the Popeyes after that and get some jambalaya rice? I was so pissed. I was about to lose my mind. And then I had to go back through the security mess and this guy in front of me is hammered trying to get through in a wheelchair. It was just like out of control. Did you go to the airport location of the Exqualo Fun Bar to get a burrito to go? <laughs> Two people are going to get that joke. All right. Well, that's it for the mailbag. If you'd like to submit something to us, it's... Info at 215podcast.com. We love to hear from our listeners and uh, share what they're up to. No flight advice today written in, Max. So we're just going to issue some flight advice to all of our listeners. That, of course, is that they need to be protecting their medical certificate. Our friends at Harvey Watt are the largest provider of loss of medical certificate insurance and pilot life insurance for professional pilots out there. Over 70,000 of your colleagues already use Harvey Watt to protect that income, protect the paper, the green and the the white paper. I I know there's a few of you, every time you hear this ad read, you go, God, I really need to do that. I got to put that on my list. Now is the time. Get a quote, call, pitch it to the boss or pay for it yourself. Protect yourself. You're more exposed. Statistically, the odds of you having a loss of medical for a period of time is significantly higher than probably a lot of other forms of insurance you carry. So, Absolutely. HarveyWatt.com for all of the coverage information. Do not delay. All right. On to the main event. A great show today, Max. Of course, it's a topic that we both love discussing because it's a topic that we're both passionate about, and that is loss of control. and the recovery process if something were to happen to your aircraft. We've both been through the training. You used to teach an upset recovery course in a decathlon. This is one of those things in aviation as a professional where there are certain things that you don't have to worry about because the regulation makes you do it. And this is one of those things that the data is very apparent. We have airplanes that are hitting the ground fairly consistently at this point. From single engine general aviation airplanes to airline to A340s and everything in between that are hitting the ground because of loss of control. Yet the FAA has kind of peaked an eyebrow at it, but they really haven't attacked this deficiency in aviation. And so that's why I think this is one of those things that we as aviators have to take upon ourselves and try and work and train that deficiency in the business as a whole out. And this is the best way to do it. And there's other ways to do it, which we'll talk to from an online course to actually going and flying a S211 Marchetti jet. Okay. First up, Randy Brooks from APS. Max, as a uh, father of young children, the term upset recovery, I'm thinking more about like keeping my kids calm. Yeah. Offering snacks and other bribes. Exactly. But to get the real definition of upset recovery, loss of control, we've got Randy Brooks joining us. He's from Aviation Performance Solutions here in Phoenix, Arizona, the VP of training and business development down there at that operation. We are both graduates of this program, Max, and uh, we're excited to have Randy join us. Welcome, Randy. Thank you very much for having me on, guys. Uh, It's going to be a pleasure talking with you. Randy, we're so excited to chat with you because this is an extremely relevant topic right now. We've seen over the past 12 months, several high profile crashes in business aviation. We don't know all the details yet, but certainly a lot of folks suspect that loss of control could be a factor. So we just wanted to chat with you a little bit today about 
What is loss of control? How can we combat it? What are the resources out there? And so we're excited for you to share with us. So could you start off a little bit by explaining a little bit about your background and, and what it is that you do? Absolutely. So uh, degrees in aerospace engineering. Fortunately, I haven't had to use that too much. I've mostly made my living in the cockpit. I began teaching aerobatics back uh, in Boulder, Colorado, after I graduated from school there and rather quickly joined the circus, the flying circus, that is, joining up with Red Baron uh, Squadron with Flying 450 Stearmans. Uh, did that in what I call three different tours. The first tour was the inaugural air show team for ship formation aerobatics. Met a team that was flying pit specials, which I had taught aerobatics in prior to joining with uh, the Red Baron Squadron. And, and the pits has a lot more capability. It's a Ferrari versus a Cadillac. So I did uh, flew for six years with that team. It was a set of Vietnam era fighter pilots and myself. We were sponsored by Holiday Inn's Holiday Inn aerobatic team. That team unfortunately met its demise with the leader when we were going to be the first jet team when L-39s became available after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I went back to work with Red Baron with the intent of moving laterally over to the corporate flight department to get myself some multi-engine turbine time because I was having kids and had to grow up and all of those things did that. And then I got called back to be the director of operations for Red Baron did that. So for a few years, I had the enviable position of flying uh, formation aerobatics and 450 Stearmans one day and flying trips in a Citation 5 the next. I kind of knew there weren't a lot of people with that opportunity. But right. I could also see that the handwriting was on the wall for the Red Baron squadron. It was losing its marketing luster. And so about that time, there were these very light jets that were springing up in Albuquerque, Eclipse Aviation, and they were looking for somebody to run an upset program for them using an L-39 Albatross. So I flew that out of Albuquerque for three years, as well as doing some production flight tests and various other things. That was a lot of fun. It was kind of a crash course in aircraft certification and then a lot of other things before the doors closed there. I did three years out of the cockpit just to convince myself that I belonged in a cockpit. Although <laughs> it was aviation related, it was for a a simulator engineering and manufacturing firm that had made the simulators for Eclipse. And it was really a great opportunity to do a lot of worldwide travel, got to do tip my foot into flight test engineering, gathering flight test data for some aircraft to program simulators with. So like most of us listening, I had used the simulator as a consumer, you know, to go to training every six months. But this let me kind of appreciate it from a design and engineering standpoint. But during that time, the Royal Aeronautical Society was uh, putting together a group to investigate training to reduce or mitigate the threat of loss of control in flight. And I met the good folks at APS there, uh, worked side by side with them for three years, coming up with a training matrix and identifying a lot of different training that pilots could needed. And then when they had an opening, they invited me to come join them, which I was glad to do. So that's been almost 10 years ago now. Wow. Quite a resume. So have you been upside down more than right side up in your logbook? Do you count that? How do you track that? <laughs> I don't count aerobatic time. I count it more by types. And I've got 3,000 hours in the Stearman, 2,000 hours in the pits. I'm uh, approaching 2,000 hours in the extra. Just recently got my letter of authorization in the S211 and, of course, the three years fly in the L39. So um, approaching 15,000 hours and more than half of that has been in aerobatic aircraft, yes. Wow. Favorite aerobatic maneuver? Rolling 360s. So I saw Betty Stewart, a, a woman's world aerobatic champion, twice from the U.S., do this maneuver at an air show doing a 360 degree turn while rolling four times. And I didn't even know that you could do that with an airplane because I'd grown up watching, like most people, military teams, Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. And when I saw that maneuver, I was like, I'm going to have to teach myself to do that maneuver. And so as a poor broke college student, devoted a lot of thought and energy because I had more of that than I had money. And when spring came, I went out and jumped in the pits and did about 10 rolls and the nose had turned about 30 degrees. So I was like, well, I'm going to need some <laughs> help with this one. Fortunately, I had a college professor that had done some competition, and he said, no, just learn how to do a 90-degree turn while doing a 360-degree roll, and then you put four of those together. And so now I can do them rolling left, rolling right, turning right, turning left, 
a lot of fun. That's cool. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about the training that you guys are producing here, this upset recovery training. Max and I go to the sim and we do the unusual attitudes and we close our eyes and the instructor does the <laughs> trims and play. Isn't that enough? I mean, what is it that you guys are doing? Well, two things. One is that you're familiar, everybody listening that's ever taken a check ride, we've got these two different training tasks. We have unusual attitudes and we have stall training. Well, in real life, those two things are not separated. In fact, it is more likely that if you are in a stall for any period of time, the lateral instability is going to lead you into a severe attitude. Then you are confronted with a situation that is more complex than licensing training currently prepares for a stall and an unusual attitude at the same time. Now, part of the reason that we don't do those things together, even though the aircraft can, is because the simulator cannot do those things. It doesn't have the degree of programming sophistication to do all of that. In fact, most people think that they do stall training. And in fact, I had fun. I was with a, a group of corporate pilots a year or two ago and said, okay, how many of you did stall training the last time you were in the simulator? All of the hands in the room went up because they assumed they were doing stall training. Well, you're supposed to recover at the first indication of stall, which by definition occurs prior to the full aerodynamic stall. Now, if the airplane behaved at the same way at or beyond the stall as it does at the first indication, then loss of control in flight would not be the big problem that it is. So there's a lot of people in your audience that are listening going, what, what, how is the airplane different? Well, it's crazy different. And in fact, for the listeners that are in the 121 world, their simulators have had to be modified now to go to 10 degrees of angle of attack beyond the first indication of stall. Now, what's weird about that is that rule was made by Congress and passed down by the FAA, but for the folks that fly corporate, they go to the sim, and their simulators are only programmed to the first indication of stall. The reason for that is the simulator is designed as a training device, and the training stops at the first indication of stall. If you go beyond that, then you failed the check ride. So for all of those folks that I asked if they did stall training that raised their hand, they didn't. They would have failed the check ride if they had gone to the full stall. So most of the loss of control in flight accidents, regardless of sector, involve a component of stall. The aircraft was stalled in over 50% of the cases. And the problem is that the stalls that pilots see in the real world are so different than the stalls that we practice, which can be very procedural in the simulator that pilots don't even recognize it as a stall at all. I have an interesting thought to add to that. So a long time ago, I flew a beach jet. It was serial number one. And just for reference, beach jet does not have a pusher. And went to the sim, you know, got my type rating and did went to the sim once a year. But every for my six month 135 check, we would do it in the airplane. And I flew with this guy who'd been flying the beach jet for 100 years. And we would go do a training flight before I'd have the FAA resource to observe the PIC check, right? And we went up and he's like, have you ever stalled the jet? And I'm like, well, you know, we did it in the sim. He's like, well, the real thing. And so we went up in the practice area and we stalled the airplane like a real stall. And we did that and I came away with it. Essentially what you're saying is like, that was nothing like the simulator. That's the first time people see that is when they actually do it. And unfortunately they're too close to the ground or whatever, but that was very eye-opening and, and kind of lends credit to what you're saying. Yeah, and unfortunately, because the sim is so realistic in the normal envelope, which is where we're normally operating, instructors and pilots tend to believe that anything that the simulator does, the airplane does, because it represents the airplane that when they fly it, it flies just like that, right? And so I have a number of cases where I provide this kind of information to instructors and they go, yeah, I've been teaching in the Sovereign and we hold the oak all the way back and show people how good the ailerons work in the stall and everything. I probably shouldn't be doing that, right? And I'm like, no, you're dealing <laughs> with misinformation right there, negative training, because what that does, and there's a number of simulators that may or may not play along and give some kind of behavior, behavior that's extrapolated or interpolated and has nothing to do with the nonlinear behavior of the aircraft beyond critical angle of attack. Now you're lying to the pilots and telling them that the airplane isn't really threatening. And in real life, if you get beyond that state, that warning or that shaker or that pusher, 
Now you're in a place where the airplane is going to behave very, very differently. And pilots don't do well with things that they have not seen before. And therefore, we have upset prevention and recovery training to show pilots those kinds of behaviors in the aircraft so that they will have seen it before. And, and the best part about that is the deterrent effect, because when you see what's really going to go beyond, go on, if you get into a stall and stay there, you're not going to want to be there. And, you know, this is not necessarily because of anything that pilots do wrong. Systems break. We get icing and your stall, your angle of attack veins might not work. And, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to me. There are four aerodynamic characteristics of a stall that every airplane has, at least one or up to all four. And we don't, it's not even required information, even for an ATP. It's information that's in a guide called the Airplane Upset Recovery Training Aid, which most pilots have never heard of. And the thing is that pilots are familiar with most of them, buffeting, okay? Every pilot's seen that before. The next one, pilots wouldn't say it the way it was written, but it's a lack of pitch authority. This is when pilots go yokes all the way back and the nose drops. We call that a pitch break or jeep break. Most pilots are familiar with that. But the one that is actually the most confusing, compromising, incapacitating is the lateral instability that airplanes exhibit past the first indication of stall. And even for the modified simulators at the 121 carriers that have an enhanced envelope, they won't exhibit fully the behavior that the aircraft is going to because they have increased the amount of angle of attack information that the simulator is programmed with, but not necessarily the side slip or beta information. And so it's going to be more benign. And the reason that I know this is I've been in five different simulators that have been modified for the enhanced envelope. And then I look at recently, it was a 737NG in Russia. They had really good animations from the flight data recorder of a sustained stall that it had. And it was going way beyond where the simulators would in terms of roll authority. It was rolling to 90 degrees of bank either way. And not something that pilots are typically trained for because, you know, most folks that are listening are aware that to get a commercial license, a pilot only needs to go to 60 degrees of bank. In fact, if they go beyond 60 degrees of bank, they fail the check ride. And so now in real life, if they ever do stumble into a stall and the aircraft due to lateral instability goes beyond 60 degrees of bank, now they are in uncharted territory. And what they will do is apply what works in the normal envelope because that's where they spend 99.9% of their time. And unfortunately, some of what they would do that would work well or be the right thing to do in the normal envelope immediately becomes not only not helpful, but even catastrophic when done. So we actually have to teach pilots sort of a new way of responding in the upset domain. And not surprisingly, it's a little bit harder, the more experience the pilots have. You know, you take a 7,000 hour pilot that's been flying at 1G for the last 6,500 hours, and it's harder to train them than the 80 to 120 hour cadets that come to us. You just tell them what to do and they do it. But yeah, a lot of times what's required is a little bit different than what first comes to the pilot's mind. So this loss of control problem, it's shown up recently, as we mentioned. Is that something that only inexperienced pilots get into? What are the traps we're seeing? Why is this such a big problem right now? The big problem is that we have convinced ourselves, and this is easy to do because aviation is inherently now pretty, pretty safe, is that we've convinced ourselves that the way that we're training pilots is the right way and we are providing pilots with everything that they need and that's true in the normal envelope probably the flight training that we do today is better than it's been in history at any time the problem is that we aren't preparing pilots for the way the aircraft could behave if they ever leave the normal domain so you know you get beyond that 60 degrees of bank or you get beyond the critical angle of attack. And now we've given the pilots virtually nothing to go on to explain to them how the situation is different. Let me just talk about stall just a little bit, because right now a pilot is only required to do one stall in their entire career. And that's on a private pilot checkride, because by the time you get to your commercial license, 
you recover when the stall is imminent, before I feel buffeting. Okay, well, that's going to be before the critical angle of attack. And then, as we've already discussed, for a type rating or an ATP, you're going to recover at the first indication of stall. So, for the listeners that are familiar with Air France 447, which you know famously stalled over the South Atlantic from 38,000 feet down to the level of the ocean, they were in that stall for three and a half years. But the three pilots that were on board, had likely not seen an actual stall in an actual airplane for decades. And so no wonder that they might have been surprised by what was going on. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you can see the thought process of training the muscle memory and the reaction to the first indication of a stall. But certainly you have to see what the other side of it is. And and what you were just saying, so I taught upset recovery when I was a flight instructor to students, right? Not experienced professional pilots. And I was wondering that when you were talking about it in my head, I'm like, God, it it was a lot easier when I did it because you could see when you would put them to upside down or bank angles they'd never been to yet, they would freak out initially. And that's the reaction that unfortunately most people have if they get into that for the first time. And then, but very quickly would they adapt and they would be very comfortable flying upside down. And the recovery is not hard. You just have to experience it because it's unsettling if you're not used to it. But I could see the job of training professional pilots with potentially thousands of hours flying around on autopilot and 30 degrees of bank could make your job a little more challenging. Let's focus for a second, Max, on your use of the word unsettling. That's certainly true. It's unsettling when these pilots see these things. But when it happens to us in training, they got a parachute on their back. They're expecting something. They're unsettled. When it happens to them in their aircraft, where they're not expecting this to happen, and it could be night, it could be in the clouds, it's more than unsettling. It's incapacitating. So we've got to do a good job of training them in a manner so that they can get through those human factors. I used to think that this was about teaching flying skills, and it certainly is, but it's more importantly about being able to access those skills in a situation where your life is in danger, your passengers' lives are in danger. And in a famous study done by Boeing and NASA together, you only have about six to 10 seconds to deal with it. And that was the period of time that they measured between the onset of an upset until the limitations of the aircraft were exceeded in one way or another. And so we're not any of us so smart that we're going to figure out a new or different way of flying the airplane in six to 10 seconds. But as you said, it's not like it's hard. It's not really. It's just different. And when we begin teaching pilots, they'll go back and do it exactly the same way. And we deal at APS with what we call integrated training, where we put three components of training together, academics, so we explain a lot of the background in detail, then the on-aircraft training, and that's important because of the human factors, because in the simulator, you're always going to be at 1G. But then we go back into the simulator, and a lot of people listening might go, well, why are you doing that? You've already been in the airplane. Well, I'm not going to fly the airplane close to the ground. I'm not going to fly the airplane at night upside down, yet that is where the threat of loss of control in flight can be the highest. So when we fly with people in the airplane first and then we go into the simulator, now they are taking that experience with them and sort of imagining those Gs that they just felt and teaching them how to apply it in a situation with a glass cockpit side by side We can induce some crew resource management, but an interesting thing happens to us. We've just completed four flights with them in the aircraft, and that's another thing, that this doesn't take a long period of time. I mean, four flights in the span of a pilot's career is nothing. It takes two and a half days for us to accomplish this training. But when we go back into the simulator, they go back into the same mindset that they've been training in in a simulator and so they start doing flying the airplane like they did before training and we're like wait didn't we just teach you in those four flights a new way of flying the airplane and yet here you are and it just shows how we do everything that we can to teach people in a transferable way okay so all of the lessons that we're teaching in the extra 300 or the Cy Marchetti S211 that we use here at APS, we're not teaching eight-point vertical rolls. That would have no relevance to somebody flying a King Air or a Boeing or an Airbus. But I can teach people that if they unload to a half a G, 
they reduce their angle of attack. And I've already said that 50% of our loss of control in flight events are based due to stalls. So when we teach them this handy method, now we have something that's transferable. And the reason that we don't teach this concept of unloading in the simulator is because we can't, because we're bolted to the ground. And so we can't practice going to a half a G. But one thing that is transferable is a half a G in an extra or a half a G in an S211 feels exactly like a half a G in any other aircraft. So, Randy, I think a lot of people are under the impression when you go to upset recovery training, you, you go there and you pull your lips off and you're doing a bunch of competition aerobatic maneuvers. But can you kind of explain how you guys do it? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because we began the conversation talking about aerobatics, right? So it's easy for me talking about a very complicated aerobatic maneuver that I like just because of its complexity, but that has no relation to transport category aircraft. And when you guys were initially going through UPRT, a lot of upset prevention recovery training was a little bit more like aerobatics. But the difference here is that when I'm doing aerobatics, I'm doing a known maneuver. I'm going to teach you how to do a loop. I'm going to teach you how to do a half Cuban or a hammerhead in whatever training aircraft that we are using. But I've just introduced this concept of transferability. And so I am using our training platform in UPRT as a surrogate aircraft for whatever your operational aircraft will be. And one of the things that I kind of enjoy is getting into the nuance of the differences of the systems between a Challenger and a Gulfstream or a Learjet or a Boeing and knowing a little bit about all of those different types. What's the difference when I have underwing mounted engines that are going to provide a pitch up moment, some things like that. But for upset recovery, we've got to teach people to recover from an unknown situation. So we don't want to teach them something that is too strict or too procedural because there are literally an infinite number of different upset situations that they can be faced with. So at APS, we teach them a strategic response that is flexible, but which addresses all of the things that we have to manage in an upset event in the priority that they need to be managed. And so we come up with a method that can be applied not just against stalls, but also nose high and nose low maneuvers as well. So we are flying those surrogate training platforms as though they had a two and a half G limit load like a transport category aircraft would. I find it very interesting. We do all of the subject matter expert training for United Airlines and Delta Airlines. So they have their flight crews come and fly with us in the extra and take that back under licensed training that they provide in a trainer role. And because of this all attitude upset recovery strategy that APS has evolved over a 25 year period, Boeing or uh, Delta and United, both neither of them use the call-out uh, stall anymore. They use the call-out upset because they're going to respond in a similar fashion, whether it is a stall, nose high or nose low situation, using with a flexible response based on the situation and what their energy states are, the same sort of strategy that they've learned here through APS. The point that you hit on earlier, that was what hit home for me when I did the training on feeling what one half G feels like. And it's so funny because if you really start to think about your flying and transport category airplane and all the training you do, you almost always pull back on the yoke, but you almost never push down. And the muscle memory of making that push to get to a half G, just doing it a few times. Do I have to go really fast? Is it slow? How does it feel? It's just something that we never do. So to me, that was really relevant. Let me go to address the pushing forward, pushing back, because yeah. anybody that's listening that learned to fly before 2012 in the last 10 years, prior to that time, there was an objective stall testing criteria, minimize loss of altitude. Well, right. if I'm minimizing my loss of altitude, it requires me to pull back on the yoker stick just a little bit to keep from losing altitude, right? And if I'm trying to reduce my angle of attack, I have to go forward on the yoke or the stick to reduce the angle of attack. Well, guess what? You can't do both at the same time. So where I met the folks at APS, Clark McNeese and I were both invited to participate in the FAA Industry Stall Stick Pusher Working Group. Now, this happened after a Colgan crash where the flight crew did not respond appropriately to a stall. 
And the FAA said, we need to look at the way we're doing our training. And that was when we pointed out this contradiction in what we were telling pilots. And we were fundamentally teaching them the wrong thing to do by teaching them to minimize altitude loss. Because until you reduce the angle of attack and get rid of that lateral instability that I was talking about earlier, you don't have a stable airplane to fly. And so training was changed at that time. It was advisory circular 12109 on uh, stall training. It's now 12109A on stall prevention and recovery training. And we make it very clear that's a consideration when you're close to the ground, right? But in many most cases, you only are going to have to lose a few hundred feet, but it's going to be worth it to be able to recover from the stall. Tacking onto that, one thing that we've seen, and we don't know all the details about some of these crashes, uh, the Challenger crash in Truckee and, and the one in San Diego recently, but certainly you can see a scenario where this base to final overshoot sets you up for this stall spin scenario. And exactly like what you're saying, you're close to the ground there. The last thing you would want to do is unload the airplane and push down. Can you talk a little bit about that type of scenario and, and why that's so dangerous? Yeah, let's talk about it in the case of an example that we do know was loss of control in flight in an accelerated skidded stall, and that's a Lear 35 going into Teterboro, right. where they kind of overshot, they pulled hard. We know from the way that the airplane rolled, hitting the ground at 90 degrees of bank, that that's exactly what happened. So we think about these base turning final skidded stalls in the context of 172s. But guess what? The aerodynamics involved are exactly the same, whether it's a 172, a Learjet, a Challenger, whatever. And that, again, is one of the reasons that we can use our aircraft in a transferable manner because we're teaching these aerodynamic concepts and the laws of physics that apply to all of these aircraft. So one of the things that bothered me about some of the Monday morning quarterbacking that I've seen on blogs regarding the Truckee accident or more recent one mm -hmm. in San Diego is that there are very well-meaning people that are saying that's why we need to do more training in the simulator to try and practice for these kinds of things without knowing or understanding that you cannot train in the simulator for these situations or types of things because the simulator is not programmed to accurately replicate a skidded or slipping mm. stall, a stall with the ball out of the center, and to illustrate the behavior that you're going to have. And in fact, we at APS can't teach you to recover in the amount of altitude that would be available at base turning final generally either. However, what we can do is take you up to a safe altitude, show you what would happen so that we make good and sure that you are never going to want to see that happen to you. I'll give you a good example. I ran our operation in uh, Arlington, Texas for APS for about eight and a half years. I stood that operation up. We used to train a lot of pilots from Fort, Foot, Fort Hood. And this pilot was, I think, an MC-12 pilot, variant of the King Air. And he had come to training with us, and he was flying five flights with us, and he'd done, I think, three. And then the weather got bad for several days. And because it was only about a three-hour drive away, we said, just go home, and we'll reschedule after the weather breaks. So he comes back to us two weeks later, and he goes, I've been flying twice since I was here, and both times I was in the pattern, and the ball was towards the high wing, a skidded condition that he had been taught to look for. And we said, well, you're welcome. It's probably happened to you before, but before you didn't know what to look for and you didn't know what the ramifications of stalling in that situation would have been. So it was prevention in that case. And so now allow me to go on a little riff here about prevention versus recovery, because there's a lot of people that say, well, we don't need to teach people how to recover from upsets. We need to teach them how to prevent it in the first place. And guess what? Every right-thinking pilot listening to us today would have to agree with that. But what's missing from that, in which I know you gentlemen will appreciate because you've seen the benefits of this training, is that if you really want to prevent these things, then teach people upset recovery. Because once you've seen what happens, it changes your mental model of the aircraft's flight path, what it's going to be in an upset. And it enhances your pattern recognition. You now know all the little things to look for because you've just gone through dozens of upsets and you've seen how they got there. You go through it a dozen times to practice enough to be able to get proficient at the recovery, but it makes it less likely that you're going to have to use any of the fancy flying skills that we're teaching you in the first place. That's well said. So now 
let me ask you guys this. Why is the FAA, since loss of control in flight, has been the number one cause of fatalities in every sector of aviation for decades, why are they not interested in looking at this and what we could do and how we could change things? I think they're good at nudging it a little bit because at the airlines, we have EET training, extended envelope training. We have these pieces, which is good training, but I think to complete the circle, to really have an impact here, you have to do multifaceted training. Like while the extra doesn't fly like a 737 or an XLS, it's a safe way to feel some of the things that, that do parallel what those airplanes do. And then the extra also doesn't recover from a stall or act like it does at 8,000 or 10,000 feet, like a jet does, a swept wing jet does at 41,000 feet, which is a good place to sometimes see that in the simulator. And while it may not act exactly like that, it gives you something to work with. And the other thing too, I think that's really important with all of these things, like we said, it's you're startled and, and, and people freeze up if they haven't seen this before. The other thing that's a company that really opened my eyes was when I did the 737 MAX return to service training which would have happened in both of the MAX accidents as well as the Air France, is all of these warning systems going off while you're trying to fly. And I I was flying a visual approach, just a clear in a million in the sim, flying a visual approach. And it was so hard. (laughs) It was exponentially harder because all I heard was airspeed low, airspeed low, and all this stuff from these malfunctions that were going on, which like you can barely focus on flying a visual, let alone an advanced maneuver or recovery from something. So back to your original question, the FAA, I think that they're peaked an eyebrow and they're like, well, we can do this in this extended envelope training, which like I said, is good training, but it's only part of the complete puzzle. And I don't really know why they haven't. I'm sure people object to the cost of the training is probably one of my questions I have written down here is like, has there been any airline that's ever come and be like, hey, could we train 10,000 guys and gals to put this through your training? And I don't know that that's even feasible or, or how that would work. Interesting, there isn't an airline that's done that, but ICAO did that. So after I was involved with the Stall Stick Pusher Working Group and and that advisory circular, we got involved before and right after I joined APS with ICAO. They were looking at the problem too, because it's not just a U.S. problem. And so they looked at the overall, and we were doing this for our project with the Royal Aeronautical Society going, when should we be doing the training? And we identified, because it's unrealistic to train hundreds of thousands of airline pilots on aircraft, when we're doing on-aircraft training is during licensing training. The Loss of Control Avoidance and Recovery Training Aviation Rulemaking Committee, which was an FAA committee, made the recommendation, and they used these words, for upset prevention and recovery training in actual flight prior to commercial licensing. So they recognized it and said, yeah, we should be doing this and we should be doing it for every commercial pilot before they get a commercial license. That's the right way to do it. Now, interestingly, even though it came from a recommendation from a U.S. ARC, it's not the U.S. that implemented it. EASA looked at that recommendation, and they actually have a requirement now for three hours of on-aircraft upset prevention and recovery training. In their case, they didn't put it prior to the commercial. They put it prior to an ATPL or a type rating, so slightly different position. Unfortunately, they watered it down a little bit so that it's not quite as effective. I was involved in Cologne and some of the conversations, and we were trying to make sure that they had to use an aircraft that was capable of 360 degrees of roll and 360 degrees of pitch because upset accidents can go to all of those attitudes, crazy as it seems, even in some accidents with Boeings and other aircraft, but they watered it down. So anyway, we have identified a good way to do it. But yes, in all fairness to them, it is a rare form of accident, even though it's the number one cause of fatalities. And it would cost a little bit of money, but it's really not as much as most people think. And certainly in the course of a professional pilot's career, it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, I've often said to Dylan before in just private conversation, I have three boys. And I said, if if any of them want to learn how to fly, they'll never even solo until they've flown upside down. Because what would you say the percentage of people that come to your training that have never flown upside down? It's the majority. And I treat pilots when we step out to the airplane as though they have never been upside down. 
because I'm going to introduce things in as mild a manner as I can. And so a lot of times I will ask them as after we're getting out of the aircraft on the first flight, is that the, or I'll ask them after our first aileron roll, is that the first time you've ever been upside down in the airplane? And I have a, a significant portion that have not. Now, if they have, it was usually a ride with a friend in their decathlon or a pits, which again, in terms of transferability, really doesn't do anything that helps them in terms of their day-to-day flying in a transport. All right. Let's address the elephant in the room here. For folks that are listening that are maybe a little apprehensive and they go, this sounds like great training and I can see the benefit, but I don't really want to go upside down. I might get sick. It sounds uncomfortable. How do you guys handle that? Are there some people that are just not going to do it? What have you found? First of all, I have had people that are here because their bosses, their flight department, their unit commander in the the military has asked them to come here that don't find it fun. The vast majority of people really do enjoy it a lot and find it very enjoyable. But I have never had any of them that didn't say that it was worth it. Even if they were uncomfortable, they still thought that it was some of the best training that they have ever had and that they would recommend it for anybody else. Now, Personally, my job for 13, 14 years of my life was giving rides to the uninitiated aerobatic flights to press people in doing air shows, which I flew professionally for 10 years. And so I got very good at making people comfortable and identifying, we talked about enhanced pattern recognition. Well, I could figure when somebody's getting quiet or they're a little less enthusiastic, if people aren't feeling well, then it's time to come home because then they're not learning. And in our course, if you're going to go through four flights, you're going to acclimate during that period of time. So it's extremely rare that I don't get through all of the exercises in our standard syllabus with people. There could be people that have inner ear disturbances and some things like that. They're going to always get motion sickness and when they go out on a boat, things like that. But I tracked my record and it was less than 4% of people that got actively motion sick In flying with me, I also saw that that was a little bit better than some of my brethren that didn't have all of the ride-giving experience that I had. And you know what? It's just an occupational hazard. We explain to people where the bag is and how to get to it and give them time and don't shame them. And so it's not as big a deal. And a lot of people that are able to get sick and go, okay, continue. You know, we'll put this bag away, tuck it away, and, and they feel better after they've purged and we go on. But really, for the vast majority of people, it's not really an issue. So you just pay that extra little uh, 10% premium to request you as their, your instructor. Is that, is that what you're saying? I do get referrals. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Especially if it's in the summer in Phoenix. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really need some good touch. Funny. So Randy, Max and I have had uh, many conversations about the AOA gauge or AOA indication that are in the cockpits of some airplanes. And unfortunately, not every transport category airplane displays it in the cockpit. Most seem to measure it in some way for some of the systems, but it's really disappointing, I think, that there's a lot of airframes that don't have AOA out there because I think it's one of the most important instruments that a pilot can reference. Do you guys talk about that in the class? Not everyone has it. How do you guys approach the AOA topic? I'm glad you brought that up because the aircraft responds more to angle of attack than it does to airspeed or pitch attitude. In fact, it doesn't really care a lot of times about the pitch attitude. It cares more about the angle of attack. And so we have to introduce that concept. We have some two exercises that we do back to back that illustrate it really, really well. The first is a sustained stall where we look at those four characteristics of a stall that we talked about earlier, and the airplane will remain in a stalled state 20, 25 knots above its 1G stall speed. And usually in that demonstration, I will maneuver so that the aircraft is stalled with the nose below the horizon. We recover from that and we go, have you ever been in a stall where the airplane was stalled above 1G? And go, no. And have you ever been stalled with the nose below the horizon? Generally not. And so now they're starting to go, oh, there's more to it than my, quote, stall speed. The very next maneuver we do, a little zoom maneuver, a little ballistic arc that we do where we slow the airplane down in a big trajectory going up about 60 degrees nose up and pushing over, we'll push over at a slow enough speed that the airspeed will recede down to less than the 1G stall speed of the aircraft that we're in. And it won't show any of the characteristics of a stall because it's not stalled because we've kept the angle of attack low. Now, 
Every pilot that I fly with has generally memorized that an airplane can be stalled at any attitude and any airspeed. And then I go, can you give me an example of that? No, I just memorized them to test. I have to say <laughs> this. And now we have shown them back-to-back -back examples to that. So now they're going, well, maybe this angle of attack thing is important. Now, back to your question as to whether or not I have an angle of attack gauge or not, I'm a big fan of a pitch limit indicator, which incorporates angle of attack information on the flight director or attitude indicator, which is where pilots are looking so they don't have someplace else to look. We do have exercises in the simulator that we do about angle of attack awareness. But one of the things that is missed by a lot of people who I agree with regarding the benefits of angle of attack is that that information by itself is not always useful if it's not accompanied by training. Because if you think about it, every aircraft that we fly has an angle of attack indicator. It's called a stall, warning horn, or device, and it might be binary. It's on or off. But if I don't know what to do, to reduce my angle of attack when I hear that stall horn or stick shaker or whatever the warning device in our aircraft might be, then that information doesn't always help. And as we've talked about, because of the human factors impacts, I don't get smarter when my heart rate goes up, my IQ goes down. So while I like angle of attack and, and as an engineer, I appreciate that that's what the airplane is really interested in. I still think that we need training on what to do with that angle of attack or how to respond to it appropriately. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the PLI because I think when you're flying and the PLI comes into view, it gets everyone's attention and not necessarily a binary number on an angle of attack gauge. And I think I've mentioned this before. One of the best advances in general aviation is the incorporation of angle of attack. And while it's not necessary, it, they don't display the angle of attack in 0.6 like they do on a lot of airplanes or whatever. It shows you angle of attack in reference to the critical angle of attack. And that's what you really care about, right? As far as we're concerned with, with upset recovery. The coolest thing, too, is the incorporation of the audible tone that represents angle of attack. And similar to a PLI that gets your attention, if you hear a beep, it gets your attention really quick. And if that's when you're turning base to final, that just might save your life. So at least we're moving in the right direction, I suppose, is the best way to say that. Yeah. And as I put it, we're not talking about the second or third leading cause of fatalities. We're talking about the number one cause of fatalities. So really, we should be approaching it and trying to fix it on all of these fronts, technical, training, academic, everything we got. Yeah. I have a question, Randy. So we talk about why we train in the extra. And while it doesn't mimic your plan, we fly it sort of within the G limits and, and everything else. But what's the benefit of training then in the S211, which is the jet? It's interesting. We have a number of Army pilots that fly with us that are generally flying turboprop platforms. And even though its acceleration characteristics are a little bit different than a turboprop, they think that it is close. It's, if you think about it, the S211, which is a single engine tandem seat jet with a slightly swept leading edge, is closer to their King Air than the Extra, okay, a light single engine aerobatic aircraft. And so it is really a wonderful platform. We have two of the aircraft here. I was just recently able to get my letter of authorization and have started doing some instruction in it. And it's kind of interesting for me taking people from the extra and then into the S211. It just gives them a much fuller picture of what an upset event would look like in their aircraft. They're going to have different control forces and throws. And so this really helps to prepare them for defeating an undesired aircraft state or upset in their aircraft. Plus, it's a whole lot fun to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one last topic we should address, especially if I'm a flight department manager, a chief pilot or anything, is obviously there's a cost to this training. And for many of us, it's a cost we're going to have to justify. We're going to have to go to our principal, the aircraft owner, whoever it is that writes the checks. And we've got the build the case on, on why to go. And I think what we mentioned before, wait, isn't it just aerobatics? Aren't we just screwing around? You know, you guys have done a great job of creating a great informational packet for potential people that want to go. That's how I approached it with our principal. I said, hey, here's some information, kind of talked a little bit about, especially for me, it was, well, don't you do this in the simulator? And, and you know, just kind of explaining, hey, it's trying to feel that half G. It's very transferable from whatever airplane. Some of that stuff was made it a very easy conversation with them. And at the end of the day, when you kind of present why there it's such a risk and why it's a big problem, why we need to mitigate it, 
it wasn't that tough to get signed off to go to training. So that's one thing to think about. And then Maxim, I know you attend usually on a little bit different program. Maybe you could talk about that as a different way to go. Yeah, our insurance provider has a, a safety program. It's USAIG and they have something called the safety vector program and they give you a bunch of options. But of course, the most attractive to me is the APS training that they pay for as part of your policy for one pilot per year. So last year I sent our other pilot. He'd never been before. So he got first crack and he loved it. Again, it's some of the best training he's ever had, which is the same thing I said after it. And you have no excuse if you have USAIG and you don't go. Yeah. And I think that for the folks listening, the fact that insurance providers think highly enough of the mitigation of risk that this training provides, that they would pay for it, should tell you something. The other thing for uh, flight departments that have more than a couple of pilots is think about the standardization aspect. It's one of the things that was so attractive for Delta and United is they have pilots trained by the military, civilian trained pilots uh, from every different place and unusual attitudes are not the thing that we uh, standardize the best in terms of how we teach pilots. But now everybody's got the same system that they can apply, the same strategy, and they can back each other up as the pilot flying and the pilot monitoring. One of the things that's crazy, more so in the general aviation 135-91 world, is that you'll go to training and you'll say, okay, Pete, you're going to screw it up. Becky, don't help him. We got to see that Pete can do this. All right, now, Becky, it's your turn. And so we take the thing that is the greatest threat that pilots are going to face in terms of the number of fatalities, and it's the only thing that we don't teach them to work together with as a crew. Right. And so that's another one of the benefits of our inclusion in an integrated manner of uh, simulator training is then we can, after we introduce the few basics to folks individually, then we'll put them together. And boy, are they a hot mess the first time that they try and do it because they don't have the words or anything. But fortunately, it only takes like five or 10 minutes of practice before they start determining which information being helpful, which information they might want to have if they were the pilot flying that would help them to identify trends that were important in managing energy and, and executing a recovery. Yeah. I think that's really well said. Randy, I have a question for you. Has anybody from the FAA been through APS training? There has never been an official assessment of APS training. One of the challenges that we have is that our training is outside of licensing training. And so they go, well, we can't look at that because we don't do that. Or they say, well, we can't do your training for free because that would be a gift. Now we do, we are a part 141 certificate holder. And so we have specialty training in upset prevention recovery training. And so an examiner does have to come, but they're looking pretty much, are, are you a safe operation as opposed to a larger scale administrator eye view of this, which we would love to have them take a look at. They're invited. All right. <laughs> but there's no forthcoming advisory circular in the works for the next 10 years. Is there is not. The... <laughs> All right. It's time for the main event. It sounds like you should have a couple of good stories under your belt. So the listeners and us always appreciate a good pilot story. I am approaching my 800th student that I have flown with at APS. So if I didn't have a good story or two <laughs> in 800 students, then I don't know. Every once in a while, I like to say around here, we have to earn our pay. And this is a point I actually wrote the instructor section in the ICAO's manual on aeroplane upset prevention recovery training. A few of my words uh, survived the editing process. But one of the points that I was trying to make in there is that a UPRT instructor has to have skills beyond normal operation of the aircraft because in addition to the upsets there you're going to do, there's the upsets that your students are going to do that they didn't tell you about because they didn't know they were going to do them. Had one of those a couple of weeks ago, a student did a classic entry into an inverted spin. And when you have flown with 800 students, you're sitting back going, well, if he does this, then we're going to end up in an inverted spin. So it's not like a big surprise. You're just watching the show unfold and you'll let it go a turn or two or three. I mean, we always have plenty of altitude to make the point and then you'll execute the recovery. But it's funny, I had another student where I had gone through training and he's flying a corporate jet, I forget which kind. So our training, like I said, had been pretty much to two and a half Gs. I probably had never seen him do more than three. And we get done and he asks if he can do a loop. And I'm like, sure. And whammo, eight Gs out of nowhere. 
you know, <laughs> fortunately, we're in an extra. It doesn't matter. He gets into the buffet, and I'm just sitting there back there laughing, going, where on earth did that count come from? So you always have to, to be on your toes looking for those kinds of things. But other aspects of training that we do at APS allow us to continue doing formation training. That's obviously outside of the scope of upset prevention recovery training, but there are some engineering test pilots that come and get that training with us because they're doing air-to-air photography or flying chase, which I had done a little bit of in the past. And so they want some to learn the basics of how to do that. So that's kind of fun stuff to do. But I should say at this point in time, we are expanding and we are looking for up to five, count them five, instructors to add at APS over the course of the next year. Now, like I said, flying in the normal envelope does not equip you to be an instructor here, but what does is 500 hours or so of operational aerobatic experience. I got it. Flying air shows or all attitude experience, I should say. Fighter pilots is where we typically have gotten folks. But I tell you what, if people haven't gotten it through listening to me, this is something that we are very passionate about. Our purpose is we help pilots bring everyone home safely. Our brand promise is every pilot trained in control all the time. And for any of your listeners that think that that's a way that they would like to give back with some of the experience that you've had over your career, look at the APS website, look at careers, send us your resume. There isn't a more fun flying job out there. And you get to go home every night and sleep in your own bed. Randy, I have one more question for you. So when I taught upset recovery, now this was usually to males in their early 20s. I wouldn't even say occasionally, but with fair regularity, somebody that was got pretty cocky when I would take them flying and wanted to pull more G's and do this. You know, I know how I used to humble those people. Do you have any techniques you want to share? So we have two kind of things. We have those kind of folks. And we have the folks that are literally trembling when they're being strapped into the airplane. Okay, so the other end of the spectrum. And in either case, we approach it probably the way you guys do at your work. We try to come across as utmost professionals there to do a job, to impart training. And if we do that correctly, at the end of training, they respect us for our abilities. They recognize and understand that we have some abilities that they don't, that they could learn from. And then we get on with the remainder of the training. See, that's another difference between the training that we were doing. This is with (laughs) mature adults dealing with other mostly (laughs) mature adults that have a lot of experience. Where I was in my mid-20s, these people were in their early 20s. And so it would be pretty funny. One of my tricks always was, We did just basic aerobatic maneuvers and stuff. And so they would start getting cocky like that. And I would just hammer us into a snap roll and I would hold it. And it would roll, 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 and then develop into a developed spin. And that usually sober people up. Okay. So here is how we use a snap roll. At the completion of training, after the third or fourth flight, all of the recoveries up to that point have been announced. Hey, we're going to do this. I'll demonstrate it first. Then you do it. At some point, and I don't know, this is something I enjoy. I'm not too sadistic, but I'll talk to him about, hey, do you have kids? What's your favorite airplane you've flown? Uh, What sports teams do you like? Anything to get their head out of what we're doing. And I've recently started taking to initiating this upset in mid-sentence. So I'm not even completing my sentence. They're just listening to me. And whammo, we hit them with about a half a, a snap roll to invert it. And what we're simulating is an unexpected wake turbulence encounter. And by this time, we have created well-trained little robots, and they just execute push, roll, power, stabilize. They come out. We'll say, what just happened? They're like, I don't know, but I just did what you told me to do, and it worked out right, which I love because it shows that our training is robust. It's not fine China that's got to be done perfectly because that's not how it's going to happen in the real world. But that is our graduation exercise. We don't do it to students until they have demonstrated to us their proficiency to recover effectively. But the importance of it, and it is very important, is then they leave not guessing whether or not they'd be able to use it, but with the confidence that they have demonstrated to themselves that they have the competence to face that if they would ever face it in real life. I distinctly yeah, remember when my instructor did that to me. <laughs> it's a very rewarding part of, of yeah. providing that training is when you see people come from zero to that point and realize that now they stand a chance. <laughs> exactly. Whereas before, probably not so much. So, 
Well, Randy, we really appreciate all the expertise you've shared with us today. As Max and I mentioned, we're both graduates of the program. We're not getting paid to say that it's awesome. Uh, we're just very happy customers and it is some of the best training that I've received. I know Max, you said, said the same for you. So we certainly encourage all of our listeners to explore this type of training because like we said, we, you don't know, like you just mentioned, wake turbulence. It could happen to anybody at any time. So the word we like to use is transformational. And yeah. I know you guys are, are locals. We're, we're located at the Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. We look forward to you guys coming and visiting our new facility. And for any listeners that are in the uh, Phoenix Metroplex, come by and say hi and take a look at our new digs because they're really set up good. And I think you'll appreciate having a look at the operation. We'll have all of the What's information up? for APS in the show notes of the podcast as well as on our website. Thank you so much, Randy, and we really appreciate uh, all you're doing to keep it aviation safe. Thanks, Randy. And I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thanks. It's been fun. Well, Dylan, now I'm really excited to go to APS next week for my three-flight, two-day course. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's like next week. It is going to be super cool. We're going to go do the simulator. We'll maybe post some clips of that, too. What maneuver are you going to request for them to do to you while you're in the airplane? Like I did a Lom Shavak last yeah, year. Yeah, Lom Shavak. That's yeah. always fun. Or any the other thing that's really fun to do in an airplane, like an extra is a tail slide. Yes, I a did lot that of aerobatic too. airplanes, you can't do it. A true tail slide. Through the smoke. That's the best part. When you go into the hammerhead yes. and smoke on and then you fall through the smoke, pivot. That's cool. It's good stuff. All right. Before our next guest. Are your finances upside down? Have you been procrastinating, evaluating your retirement? Do you feel like financially you've lost control? Have you taken your 401k and put it all into a gold fund on the advice of a captain you flew with six months ago? Are you overexposed with Bitcoin? It's time to call our friend Tim Pope certified financial planner. He's been helping professional pilots nationwide create and execute a smart financial strategy. <laughs> Check the show notes for a link to book your free appointment with Tim. All right, no more piano music. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> Here comes our I interview. Done a good PSA in a while. Yeah, That's... I know. That's kind of fun. Okay, our interview with Jared is coming up and I think this conversation we wanted to talk about, yeah, it's great to go fly the airplane out, out of APS if you can, but what if that's not possible just timing wise or, or for whatever reason, what else could we do? Does that mean, oh, we can't prepare at all? No, there are other resources out there. And uh, Jared's going to join us to talk a little bit about the course that they've created and how you can even get some training without ever sitting in the cockpit. Max, one of our favorite benefits of our partnership with Advanced Air Crew Academy unfettered access to their subject matter experts on call 24 hours a day for any questions for we have. Any question we might have <laughs> immediately answered. We'd like to welcome Jared to the program. Jared is a Airbus pilot and a subject matter expert for Advanced Air Crew Academy, and he wrote their upset recovery uh, training module. So we're excited to chat with Jared. Welcome, Jared. Hey, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Jared, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and then talk a little bit about the creation of this module? Yeah, sure. So fly an Airbus for a major carrier, been there for a little while. Before that, did uh, fractional operations for seven or eight years until the Great Recession happened and got to take a hiatus from that, not of my own choosing, but like everyone else. And before that, did uh, freight, flew on-demand part 125 freight, and then the CFI route before that and the normal stuff. So got about 12, 13,000 hours, something like that, and maybe 3,000 hours in business jets. So in between my main job as an airline pilot, I also do this on the side, if you will, because I do have kind of a foot in both worlds where I live in the air carrier world as well as still in the business aviation world at the same time. You're involved in creation of all sorts of different learning topics then, right? Yeah. So that was the one we're talking about today, which is upset recovery, loss of control. But I also do a, a couple of other modules. I am in charge of all of our security modules. 
that we do, as well as CFIT and wake turbulence. So you know, the CFIT, wake turbulence, and, and loss control all kind of blended together. And the security is just something else out there. I'm the only one that we can get roped into to, to making those modules because nobody really <laughs> wants to make those modules. But the upset recovery stuff is pretty cool. It has real world applications to it. Yeah. You know, so we were talking before we push record, the three of us have all been through the in the airplane upset recovery program training. And, you know, obviously that is fantastic. But we wanted to talk today, especially for those listeners that maybe that's not an option to go and actually train in the airplane right now. So we want to discuss some of the resources that are available for pilots, maybe their department to maybe get some learning online. Maybe we can talk about some ideas of what we could practice in this sim. So could you just give us a quick little overview of the module that you created for Advanced Air Crew Academy and, and what folks can learn? Sure. So a couple of years ago, we came up with this idea and I said, okay, how do we provide some sort of education for people who can't actually go and fly in the aircraft? And I kind of reviewed a lot of the information that was out there. You've got the ICAO documents, you've got that upset prevention recovery training aid, version two and version three they created, as well as, you know, a bunch of FA advisory circulars and such. And then one of my things that I do is I create the modules from a pilot centric point of view, pilot sitting in the seat sort of point of view. This is a guy who's now got to go shoot this approach and he can't get in the straight end. He's got to do the circle or he's up at altitude, up into the coffin corner. It's a little less academic as opposed to, you know, here's an actual guy and he's got paying people in the back and here's the things that are going through his mind. I took the course and I really appreciated the way you wrote it from that conversational standpoint in a way. And I think you mentioned in there about something about, yeah, you're worried about shoving the controls forward and not wanting the boss to spill coffee on them, you know, and stuff like that. It was just right. kind of like- Real world it, concern. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, that is part of the thing is, especially when you're flying a business jet is like, how smooth am I? You know, my passengers are comfortable and that. And, and I think you do a good job of addressing that in the course. Like, look, this is serious. There needs to be an immediate corrective action. So can you talk a little bit about some of the statistics you saw and maybe some of the prevention techniques that you talk about in the course? Oh, absolutely. It used to be that CFIT was the number one cause of accidents worldwide. Then that kind of shifted a few years ago to loss of control accidents. So, you know, I forget the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I still think that loss of control is still right up there. You had the two big crashes of the 737 MAX. And then on the business jet side, we continue to see they're generally circle to land stalls close to the ground where guys just don't have any kind of recovery time. That's kind of where I placed myself. And I said, you know, the guy's got a challenging situation. And all the things are going through his mind, as well as just general operational concerns. And again, you got the boss in the back and the boss is, you know, you want to give him a good ride, but yet how do I not even put the airplane into that situation? And then that's where I think my training is a little bit different. I'm not focusing on how do we recover the aircraft? I mean, yeah, we do put a little bit of that in there, but it's more of how do I not even get into this situation? How do I recognize the risk factors? That's kind of what I was thinking because upset training is traditionally such a hands-on you know, flying the airplane high performance maneuver type of situation, but it's really the awareness that you have to bring to the whole situation to avoid getting to that step. When you get out there in the airplane, you're learning to recover and, and do this advanced maneuvering, which the mistakes are already behind you at that point. I mean, potentially, I guess not always. It could be wake turbulence or something different. But yeah, I think people might look at this and be like, how can I get upset recovery training online? But I think bringing awareness to how you get to that point is really at least half the battle. Right. Absolutely. And I think that that's where we provide a lot of value is, you know, we are real world pilots. We're out there flying out there with you at the same time. And I've been there, done that, you know, I've done the approach into Aspen. I've done the circle in Teterboro, all of those other challenging places. So we write that from a actual pilot's point of view. I think that adds a lot to our, to our value. It's good. And that course really fills a void because I know personally of several people that have approached the principal or the owner, whoever writes the checks on their airplane operation to try and get them to pay for upset recovery training. And I've heard multiple people have been shot down. It's hard to get somebody to stroke the check for that sometimes. And this is a really good way to fill that gap, I think, versus all or nothing. This is something that's affordable, it's in the middle, and it's valuable. Absolutely. You know, and if you can go to those guys down at APS and actually go put your hands on the airplane. Like I experienced so much out of that. But like you said, getting the boss, getting the principal, the CEO to write that check and say, okay, yeah, you can take time off. We're going to pull you off the flight line. We're going to pull you out of the schedule and send you down there for the X number of days that you sign up for. That's kind of a hard sell, depending on what your company's going through. I think another thing too, is if you can get a little bit creative, 
and utilize this course and then take some of that training and what you learn and then apply it when you go for a recurrent in the sim. Because we, we've always been big advocates of making your own training, having things and asking your instructor to work other stuff into the training and the extra time that you oftentimes find yourself with. And I think you could almost put together your own upset recovery course with this and then with some of the advanced maneuvering stuff you can do in the sim with your extra time. No, I agree. We always end up with extra time. Everybody just slams through the approaches and the single engine stuff, but then you've always got this extra time. And the instructor always says, okay, then I just want to see. And then you kind of sit there with the deer in the headlights look. But if I had that extra time, I would have already talked to them at the training center and said, okay, we go into Teterboro all the time. And I'm constantly having to do some sort of weird circle to get in there. Can you pull that up for us at the end? Can you set that up for me? It's that challenging situation with that tailwind on the downwind base to final turn and everything gets crunched. Everything's tightened up and you're going to overshoot and you don't want to be late and you don't want to go around. The boss has got the meeting to go to. And so you tighten everything up. And then as soon as you tighten up that turn, everything starts to, all your risk factors start to increase. So yeah, I think if you could approach a training center and say, hey, can you put in the parameters for this and and make it a thousand overcast with three miles visibility and just see what it all looks like. And if you can see that in advance and understand some <laughs> of your risk factors, what happens to you in real life, uh, you're so far ahead of the game. Yeah, it's always so much better to see something for the first time in the sim. That's basically yeah. the point. And we talked about this in the last episode, Max. Does the Airbus show you AOA, Jared? No. All the information is there. It gives, yeah. We call it the bird. I forget what the official name for it is, but it's like a flight path angle vector thing. It kind of shows you where you're going to be. But at that point, I'm too busy looking outside anyway. Yeah, I think, and Challenger is the same way. The airplane is gathering the information. They just didn't figure it was relevant to show it to the pilot for whatever reason. <laughs> Why would you display yeah. it? Yeah. It's funny, the 737 after uh, 60 years or whatever, on the Max, it, it finally displays AOA. Yeah. <laughs> but like, even if we do a scenario like we're talking about here in the sim, and you go load the airplane up in that turn, have the instructor freeze the sim for a second and be like, what's our load factor, right? Sure. Tell us where we're at in... C, I think it would be very valuable training information. And it also ties into what we were talking about, the minimum maneuvering speed with flaps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or you reanalyze it after the fact, right? And look at the chart yeah. and the whole deal. I feel like the, this scenario is not that hard to set up. We've talked about this before. Actually flying a visual approach in the sim that's not a no-flap landing, but just a visual with weird winds is probably good enough. For sure. And to be very honest, I hadn't really considered that scenario with the tailwind when you're turning base to yeah. final. Like That's just something that wasn't really in my ballpark. And then now you bring your attention to it, and then it's the next step of the obvious progression is you want to see it. And then that's the perfect place to do it, which is bring it up in the pre-brief. If you're organized and you're like, hey, here's the other stuff I'd like to do. And I know I always wanted to do the circle to 27 at Telluride, do this, that, and that. And they uh, are always very accommodating. And plus, operating the simulator is a groundhog day sort of job, right? <laughs> so a lot of well, those I events, saying, I think, yeah. are like really close to being identical. They usually kind of like sit up in their seat and like, oh, yeah, we can do that. I'll have to check and see, do you need me to print the charts out for that? What are we, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, no, no, no. We stopped doing that in the 90s, sir, but <laughs> just the, uh, <laughs> I went through that in my last recurrent, my last AQP, we got all done. And the, and the instructor says, is there anything you just want to see? And we came up with something. He like sat up straight and he's like, oh yeah, I can load all that up. He was all fired up, ready to go. Yeah. So yeah, I think the training centers are on board with it. It's just who's the operator or the, you know, the actual pilot to say, hey, I do want to see some of this stuff because they're going to get into it. Where's another one? Chicago executive, the former Powell Walker. Oh yeah. You know, you're out there, you got to come in from the north and you got to make this hard turn to land to the north and stay underneath Chicago and. All the nonsense associated with that. And it was kind of reviewing some accident statistics from before. And there have been enough incidents there. I kind of really wish they'd revisit some of the air traffic procedures there, but that's a different discussion. Another question for you, Jared. On the Airbus, we had a discussion about like minimum maneuvering speeds for each flap setting. That's on the speed tape for the Airbus. I listened to your last episode where you guys are kind of talking about, do you have the speeds? And I know the 7.3 has got like a thousand different, you know, settings yeah. and we've just got four, but that speed tape does move around, but I'm Vegas based and we're all the time shooting this thing called the RNAV visual to one nine, right? <laughs> Vegas winds are insane. Mm -hmm. at a thousand feet AGL. They're completely different than the way they are at the surface. <laughs> yeah. and, yes. and then it's nuts. So you go to make this final turn and you're at max landing weight and you got to think about your energy state. And that's going to where I'm into the proactive part. It's like, okay, what's my energy state? What's going to happen when I make this big turn? And you'll make this descending full drag, 90 degree turn. And you just watch that speed tape just climb on the low end, on the stall warning side. And it'll come up 
15, 20 knots sometimes. So you kind of have to just be ready for that. Otherwise you get a big boost in power and then you're completely unstable and now the whole thing's just wrecked. Yeah. We've talked about on the show, and I think even you mentioned it in the course a little bit, like obviously hand flying and being able to disconnect the autopilot in the auto throttle is great when you can do it. In the Airbus, some of that stuff, it's easier said than done, right? Because of some of the automation and some of the other things, like just clicking some of that stuff off. I don't know. Am I totally wrong? Or what are your thoughts no, on that? No, no, you're right. I can't remember the last time I had the auto thrust off. If it's MEL, then it's the FO's leg. I'm not right. doing that. I just flew yeah. in without the auto thrust. Yeah. I don't even know how to do that. I just look at it and get all scared and uh, start to cry a little bit. But no, that thing is heavily automation dependent. Yeah. And one of the things that my carrier is trying to do is to get us to, you know, they say hand fly and reduce the automation as much as you need to maintain your skill set, mm -hmm. if you will. So they're kind of encouraging that. But I think that the national airspace system is designed right now. I, I can't even turn this stuff off. They got such complex arrival procedures at this point. And you're meeting all these speeds and targets and, and trying to make that whole function as a crew. It's like, I'm going to take all the help I can possibly get. You know, business jets are approaching that level of sophistication, if not exceeding what I currently have. You've got fly-by-wire, you've got heads-up display, you've got all these things. So I, I do think there is some value in hand-flying the airplane just to get a feel for it. And I know that they say, okay, well, it's fly-by-wire, you don't really have a feel. Well, you still kind of can feel in the seat of your pants what the airplane's telling you. And you need to have that response. You need to have that gut instinct. You mentioned something in the course about, do you know what your power setting is on final? Do you know your pitch? I was just talking to another Challenger pilot the other day who has auto throttles. And I remember this because I went through the same thing. The first couple of years, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what it was because I just dialed in the speed that I wanted and it did it. And now I am actually enjoy flying airplanes without auto throttles much more. And now I know, obviously, weight and everything else, but it's around 55% in one. For that airplane, if it's sitting there, I know I'm going to be close. And I think that point that you brought up in the course is great. And that's another thing that listeners right now can do without having to go do any expensive training or do anything. Just pay attention a little bit more on that kind of stuff. What's my pitch and my power? Just very basic things. Yeah, something that my carrier's done that I think is unique, but I don't know, you guys tell me is when we disconnect the autopilot, we have to disconnect the autothrottles. You can't fly oh, interesting. on approach, disconnect the autopilot, and leave the autothrottles on. You have to disconnect the autothrottles. And you can leave it fully coupled to the minimum altitude or 200 feet or whatever, and then click it off and land, right? But most people are disconnecting the autopilot earlier than that, and so we have to disconnect the autothrust, which force you to manipulate the thrust levers and stay a little bit proficient. And I fly a business jet too, which does not have autothrottles. So when we had a leg without the autothrottles the other day, the captain was like, oh my God, it was my leg. And I'm like, it's no big deal. I, I'm fresh because I've been flying this other jet that has no auto throttles. And it's funny. Another thing that just happened to me is coming in to Phoenix, our planes plan all of our VNAV descents at idle thrust. So okay. idle thrust and it'll level off to decelerate for a speed and then it'll go down. And it's all at idle thrust, which is great in a perfect world, right? If there's nobody else around, it's two in the morning. You can do all your idle thrust descents all the way and, and you save a lot of gas. But in real world, it doesn't always work like that. So we're coming in and in the Phoenix, there's like a 230 speed and then a 210 and it, and it's, it slows a couple different speeds and they say, hey, maintain 250, which is no big deal, right? And you know they're still going to slow you at the 210. So you're basically just bypassing the 230. But if you put that in the box, then it screws up your path. It goes full scale oh, on the VNAV. The airplane's got to recapture it to do all this stuff. And so I just clicked off the auto throttles and it stays in the path. It would pull the thrust back and, main, and try and cross the 230, but you just leave the thrust where it is and let the plane do it, whatever it's going to do. And the captain's like, why did you do that? And I'm like, because it's like a hundred times easier than disrupting everything. And he was pretty skeptical about it, I think. What is this manual thrust mode you've put us into? Like and, I said, if the auto thrust is an op on the bus, then it's like an emergency situation <laughs> for me at this point. It's just that the philosophy is a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, it's totally different because this is built energy. from a certain way and this is kind of add-ons, I think. But yeah, so it works out. And then he says, sure. He goes, oh yeah, grab that cross at 210. And then basically once we passed and it was about time, I pulled the thrust to idle and then clicked the auto throttle back on and it just slowed down and then pushed the thrust up and crossed the 210. <laughs> he was like, huh. Absolutely. Honestly, that's kind of the, how I built that course is, you know, let's think about, it's all about energy. What they're focusing right now on is they say, okay, you've got avoidance, recognition, recovery. Those kind of the three buzzwords they're using in that order. And I'm not any good. I get airsick like nobody's business. So I don't like being upside down. So let's stay in the avoidance category. To me, it's all about energy. 
And it's about energy management and recognizing not just what you have right now, what's your energy state going to be in 30 seconds or a minute after that. And especially in, in automation management, are you successfully programming the FMS or successfully flying and fighting the ship to maintain that energy state? I mean, that's something we see with new guys coming into the bus is they don't understand that. Is this a completely radical concept to somebody who's never flown that thing before? How it manages the energy and it's, it's completely different than the seven three percent or even the Challenger. I don't know how the Challenger works on it. It's all thrust and and everything that's built in there. But I'm like, guys, it's all about energy. I mean, the whole thing is about energy state and where it's going to be in 30 seconds or a minute. That's really well said. If you don't understand it, you can fake it pretty easily. Sure. And if you fly with a pilot that really understands it, that's where the, like, the smoothness and the mastery of flying the airplane comes from is that energy management. Even just the basics of, I know the thrust needs to be at 55% in one for this approach. And they just set it there and they know as I move the flaps and the gear, everything just kind of comes together, you know, because you're understanding, oh, I know the speed's jumping up five knots, but then it's going to come back. And, you That's know, what's, and it's in a 737, speed. like he said, there's like a hundred flap settings, you know, yeah. so you want to need to be somewhere or something. The guy goes, flaps two. And you're like, ah, oh, two, not one, not five, All right. but two. I'll take that. I see your two. Now let's I go to you. 10. I'll skip five and just go right to 10. So you, you can do that? Oh, yeah, dude. It's 1, 2, 5, 10, 15, 25, 30, 40. Sounds like you're bidding on an auction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why we don't have to memorize the minimum maneuvering <laughs> speeds because there's too many of them. Too many. Oh, it's man. too much. I think they used to have to, though. Yeah. Well, Jared, this course is awesome, and I recommend it to all of our listeners to check out. Like we said, going in the airplane, obviously, is incredible. If you can't do that, or maybe you can't do it soon, go take the course in the meantime challenge yourself in the simulator, be more aware of your pitch and power, just some small things that you can do right now to really improve your piloting abilities. And your people. awareness. Yeah, I think exactly. that's the thing. Bring awareness exactly. to situations that yeah. can get you backed into a corner. Yeah. So we really appreciate you guys putting this together. Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for putting this together and what you guys are actually doing with APS as well? And the inspiration for it was partially driven by crashes and then and you get the regulatory aspect <laughs> yeah. of it where many regulatory agencies are saying, okay, you got to have this. And insurance companies are saying that too. Like part of your is BAO certification. I believe that there's a loss of control part and we kind of saw a need in the market and I had an interest in it and said, okay, let's put something together and see what guys think. And all the modules that I write are written very pilot centric for the guy that's actually sitting in the seat and he's facing the scenario. So I just kind of went with that same philosophy. And like we said before, if a guy doesn't have the opportunity to go down and actually train in an actual airplane, this is a great bridge. It's also great pre-academic, if you will, to kind of understand what's going on. But I can't stress enough, all three of us have gone down to APS and done their training. I did all mine in the extra and I couldn't believe it because I had gone to my extended envelope training the year before I kind of understand what was going on. But when I went back, actually going on the APS and flown with those guys, I was way better at it. Like I actually understood because I'd been upside down several times. I'd been in yeah. those unusual situations. And I couldn't believe what a difference it made. So yeah, I really, really recommend if you have the chance to go down and, and work with those guys and go through their courses. They're just phenomenal instructors. Myself, you, and everybody else that's gone there always says that's some of the best training I've ever gotten. Sure. And it is. They Going really back. know what yeah. they're doing. Sure. They've got their game figured out. Yeah. yeah, they do. They have that down to a science. Before we get you out of here, Jared, any good stories for us? We'd love to wrap up with a story. You said you had, what, 14,000 hours? Cargo, uh, yeah, but... part 120. you got to have something good for us, right? Yeah. I was just telling this story the other night. We were flying from, I don't know, middle of nowhere to LA at one o'clock in the morning. And I was had a relatively new guy. And I said, hey, I'm not going to do this to you, but this is what happened a couple of weeks ago. And I was flying with another new guy. And the Airbus logic is different than anything you've ever seen. So it's got a managed descent mode. And so when ATC says, hey, descend to this altitude on an actual star, then it's pretty simple. You just push. It's got push and pull philosophy. And that's the normal way. You're usually on an arrival. Wait, so and, you mean push? What are you pushing? Oh, it's up on the, they call it the FCU. It's up on the glare shield. That's how you actually you know, oh. you're set your altitudes and your descent modes and a few other things. But 99% of the time, you're on an arrival. And you just push this thing and it kind of figures out descent rates that it needs and, and power combinations. Wait, you mean like you push a button everything. on the remote control panel or what? It's a yeah. knob. Okay. Yeah. So they called up on the, up on the FCU. What a stranger. Um, yeah. Welcome to the bus, as we like to say. So 99% of the time you push for managed descent and that works great if you're on an actual arrival. If you're not on an arrival and you're just off airway, you're being vectored, you push that button and nothing happens and it just sits there. 
And so ATC says, okay, you know, clearly to send a, down to 180. And the guy pushes and nothing happens. And I look out the window and I start laughing at myself just a little bit. Cause I'm like, well, what's he going to do now? He's never not just pushed that button. And I look at him and he looks at me and I go, did you push it? He goes, yeah. I go, go oh, push it again. So he pushes it again. I go, well, push it harder. And fortunately pushed it. I thought once he slammed that thing into the glare shield, I'm like, I might have to actually say something to hear him about that. So, <laughs> and then he did something else. And I, I just, I'm starting laughing. I'm like, all right. I do have to actually descend at some point. So I have to give up and tell him what to actually do here. Which but like is vertical speed or something. That's in, not an, an option. option. It is, but you just don't use it that often. No. Yeah. Yeah. Most of their stuff. So it was just funny to watch this guy. He just, the, the look on his face, like what? Well, I pushed the button I pushed and it, it didn't go down. You now, have to say, do do? Hey Siri, start the descent. <laughs> 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 why is Fifi not descending? Ooh. No, the, the common phrase is the newer bus pilot says, well, why is it doing that? And the experienced Airbus pilot says, well, why is it doing that? <laughs> so, yeah, to watch this guy just look at me with this look on his face after he pushed the button and it didn't go down. It's like I could see the wheels turn it and he wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun for me. I enjoyed watching that. It That's reminds fun. me of some of the hijinks we used to play on the Saab turboprop at my regional airline days. There was the flight guidance panel, the same thing, basically, you know, the mode, mode control panel. And there was a button for an option that wasn't installed. So it was just a blank button on there. And so I flew with this captain one time. He goes, oh, this is so funny. He goes, if you get a new, because it was the junior airplane. So a lot of guys would upgrade on it and they'd never flown it before. He goes, when you get a new guy, every time you do a call out, push that button on the mode control. <laughs> so, you know, like, I, you know, whatever you make, like the 10,000 foot call out. And then you just push it every t- flaps 20, push that. <laughs> it is so funny. <laughs> This old freighter I used to fly had a button just like that. We never knew what it did, but you yeah. pushed it and it lit up blue. It didn't have any words or anything. So you'd take a new guy and you'd reach over, you know, you'd put the gear down and you'd immediately reach over and push this other button. And the guy's looking at you like, I don't know what that button is. I'm like, oh, everybody knows you're supposed to push that. They didn't teach you that in training? Yeah. Come on, get it together there, <laughs> new guy. Oh my God. I love these types of stories. Well, Jared, we appreciate you taking some time to join us and appreciate the content that you're creating for us to make us all better pilots and professionals. If folks have any questions, we will put uh, your info in the show notes and they can reach out. Only positive comments about the course, no negative comments. We'll have a different address sure. for that. Yeah, that'll go to Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that goes to somebody else. Perfect. Yeah, not Excellent. to me. The complaint department. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, Jared. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Jared. Right, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. All right. That's our episode on upset training. If you're upset, you're not getting upset training. I know. You should be because it's awesome. Absolutely. I have to wind the show up or my six-year-old son is going to be upset that I'm not coaching his baseball game. So <laughs> I want to thank everybody for tuning in to uh, episode 75. Thank you to APS, Randy Brooks, Jared with Advanced Air Crew Academy. Of course, our sponsors, Harvey Watt, Tim Pope. And most importantly, all of our listeners who continue to download this mediocre aviation podcast. We will have another episode in a couple of weeks. Don't forget to go to 215podcast.com and order your hat. We've only got five left. Limited edition. Limited production. That is right. Email info at 215podcast.com if you need flight advice or something for the mailbag. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, remember, flexibility is the key to air power. Meow. Meow. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.